So thanks. Um, those were some a lot of really cool talks. Uh, let me start with something that Zamin kind of talked about. Um, Zamin pointed out that in the Google project, the um, one of the key things that they did was they had really stiff gains, and I think all the RL work that has been working really well tend to use really soft gains. And I'm wondering uh, from Talia and, and Yannicka, is there something you can comment on that with uh, how so like when do we have really stiff contraction and like basically have our legs behave like stiff springs compared to softer springs? How that might relate to um, stability, maneuverability, things like this and is there something where we should like kind of learn when we're actually designing our reinforcement learning or, or robots in general? How, why should we cho choose softer gains or, or stiffer gains? I think this is a Yannicka question. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think that, um, and obviously here's like this a little bit unicorn and rainbows, but I think that for a truly truly stability and truly robustness over complex terrain you need all of them like there is it's an array there's no like stiff and compliant there's everything in between and i think that that is one of the the key things that muscles can do um despite like a, engineers might think they suck is that they that they actually are very dynamic um and because animals like have many muscles with many different function so so generally muscles are thought to have a, a function right we say oh the hamstrings are mainly to produce force but the truth is that muscles can have many functions and actually in a single stride a muscle can switch functions and i i think that that is something that you cannot with one parameter induce in something that is not truly a muscle that does not have that built-in capacity to be a sensor as Talia said but also be an actuator yeah and I'll just add that I think that there have been some really cool studies in which um, people have looked at um, joint stiffness as substrate changes so people working on elastic substrate, running cockroaches over elastic substrate, they found that the legs become stiffer. Um, I think there's also some really great work looking at lower gravity. Um, I think this is a really cool area for more research, for sure. And especially interdisciplinary research. Yeah, so I'd like to make a comment on that too. So um, I think, I, I said a little bit about mechanics because I always thought it very, very related to robotics. And uh, something I always noticed that, for example, there's a lot of benefits when we tr want to try to uh, match the impedance while we're doing, depending on, on the task itself. So, for example, if I try to push something with a lot of force one way, maybe I'll try to stabilize my hand in the other direction. So, usually when the world offers very low resistance, I want to increase my stiffness if I want to keep a uh, position. Or if I want to interact with something in the world, then I'm going to lower my stiffness uh, on the direction of that interaction, right? So I, I think that um, this is and modulating stiffness is a I think is an inherent way that uh, animals figure out how to be stable, just because our neural feedback is so slow that we need some sort of you know passive way of being stable. So this is how, what I understand from. Uh, animals and humans modulating stiffness. I don't know if you guys agree with that. Well, so you have the central nervous system, which is like relatively slow, um, but you also have peripheral um, nerves as the ones that I focus in my, on my study. And those can actually respond relatively fast. So if you think back to that temporal scale that I showed, that's that's somewhere in the middle. So like a lot of those decisions are not going through your your all the way through your brain, but those like mechanical changes of your muscle are like informed by the sensory mechanisms within the peripheral. Um, so what is that order of magnitude of time? Do you have an idea like some uh, milliseconds or something? It's, it depends on the size of your body because 
there's like a constant rate at which information can pass through your nerves. And so if you're a tiny cockroach, it's like maybe, you know, like 30 milliseconds. If you're um, much larger individual or you're like a whale or something, then it's going to be much, much slower. And so it's all kind of like length. And it's the it's the mm. path that goes from that sensor to that like processor all the way back to the motor neuron um, into what it's actuating. And then it has to generate force, right? And so you can you can actually go through and people have done this. Um, so like Devin Gindrich, for example, has done this for cockroaches, like calculating what the minimum time could be. So mm. one of the things that's actually really interesting about muscle is it's got this force or length velocity curve. Um, and so like if you are at just like a different resting length and you actuate, um, you're going to get different velocities out of it. Um, and so what's really cool is that even with no neural feedback, you could get perturbed and just based on that like perturbed position of your leg, your, your, um, your muscle is basically in a different gear um, and it's got the same actuation. It just has a different um, performance based on its na natural length. So I think that, that stuff is way, way, way faster than, um, than neural feedback. And that's what we might call like mechanical feedback or a mechanical preflex. Yeah, it's, it's a local super fast feedback. Actually, exactly. I, have, I have also a question on this topic. So in control, we don't know very well how to do force feedback. And my question is that, do we need that for the low level reflex control or no? Normally, I don't know uh, if it's the case, especially for biomechanic people, what do you think about that? I think muscles do not only have force feedback, but as well length feedback. And that comes back to the point Talia brought up. There is like a history dependence on what muscles can and, and will do. Um, so what it does at one step influences what it will do at the second step. Um, so, and that has to do with length as well as force. So when you talk about force feedback, you mean closed loop force? Feedback? Yeah, I mean, close, closing the loop around the force measurement because we always have force measurement or torque measurement through back derivability, right? So we can estimate force, but the thing is that normally we don't use in control. We do it open loop force control basically. So do we need to close the loop because it's very difficult, but uh, it's the question that if we need that or no, maybe we should let it go and control only the impedances basically. I mean, maybe something you can do is like semi closed loop where you take the sensing with one leg and then you feed it into the next leg um, so that you don't have the problem where you're doing the the sensing and the control at the same time, but then you've got like a little bit of separation between them and you still get that response. It's just maybe a little bit delayed. Yeah, I and mean, maybe uh, I think that, for example, maybe people use force feedback to assess, for example, stiffness of the ground. So if you're walking on a very soft mattress, maybe you're not doing something about that right now, but it's something that we're going to used to plan your gate sometime in the future. So maybe we can think about that on robots too, right? So looking at, you know, I know that I've contacted the ground, I know that I have this much displacement, I know my force increase. So maybe I'm I'm touching a ground that has this much stiffness. So you can tune your controller. Basically we use that as an in, in estimation problem, right? Not not really in closed loop control directly. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then same thing, for example, the slip detection. Maybe that's a good way too, right? You know there's like a crease and then there's a drop maybe I slipped so now I can tune my friction estimation of the ground to be this much and I think that that's kind of how people use it because I think that we are um, so kind of slow to that on the fly so there's a really cool talk from Professor Neville Hogan about the paradox of human performance which is awesome I suggest to everybody to watch it and he talks about how for example uh, our uh, proprioceptive uh, feedback, um, sorry, our uh, sensory feedback for touch is very slow. It's like 150 milliseconds. Um, and that's equivalent to doing controls through GPS. So it's very slow. Um, so he thinks that a lot of those, a lot of breaking down, a lot of that we do is, is feed forward force control. Um, so I think that in that sense, maybe we use that force feedback for some sort of 
parameter tuning much more than we use the local best and best. That's my guess. Uh, on that note, um, I think a lot of the these really explosive uh, motions that we, we'd like to be able to do, like the escape maneuvers, but also like parkour, rely really a lot on feed forward. Um, if you watch these, um, like the training sessions up to the point where they actually record their performances, they'll do the same uh, jumps a few times before they actually nail it and, and get everything right. And so there's, you know, you, they don't really learn this one policy and then they can just use it. They kind of need to fine tune the feed forward for that specific, uh, not just that specific skill, but that specific terrain and that specific obstacle and, and stuff like that. Um, I think that's a bit something that's missing in our, our current um, controller designs. I'm just wondering, um, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe let's start with uh, Zhao Ming. I think in reinforcement learning especially, we rely a lot on more reactive policies and not so much uh, predictions. Uh, how would you bring this in? Uh, you're muted, by the way. Yeah, sorry. I was so uh, So, yeah, I think to, so reinforcement learning is basically just very reactive, as you said, but I believe to make it really useful, we need to combine long-term horizon planning into the equation. And yeah, so I don't have a glance. So for example, one like not related to control of robots, but in terms of like the uh, playing chess or playing Go, if you look at AlphaGo or AlphaGo Zero, uh, you often have a policy that tells you, well, where is the most promising next step to do, but then you also do a Monte Carlo tree search to find out all the possible future resulting from that move and determine whether that's really a good move or not. So I believe like a long-term reactive, reactive uh, control plus long-term planning is a way to go. Yeah. Uh, for like complicated planning task, for example. Mm. Yeah, so I'm just going to make a comment again. <laughs> so there's another really cool work from John Mattis, and he studies vision, the role of vision in locomotion, which is really cool work to also recommend. And he said that um, people look, if, they, if people are working on rough terrain, they look where they're going to step, about two steps in advance. And the hypothesis is that we do that because we want to kind of leverage the natural dynamics of the body is such that we can adjust the motion on the fly. And I think it also goes back to the fact that I think that, you know, we, we're just too slow system to do something about it at a time. But robots are incredibly fast. So we can do stuff in microseconds. So do you think that the reason why reinforcement learning is successful as reactive control is because robots are really fast or because, you know, reactive learning should be good enough for, for no matter what? Yeah, so I don't think the fast is a reason that reinforcement learning works. So for example, uh, in reinforcement learning, we typically update our control signal like at 50 or 30 hertz, so it's not operating super fast. Well, unlike a lot of the model-based controller, they operate at 500 hertz or even 1000 hertz kind of thing. So I don't think fast is the reason and yeah, so what's the second part of the question again? <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that, that was it. I, oh, maybe, okay. the reason, then maybe the reason model base works is because it's fast. <laughs> mm. Because 30 hertz is very slow. That, that's crazy. Yeah. I don't know about that. Well, I, I, actually, that's a great point with the, uh, thanks for bringing up John Mattis's work because that was- Steve, can you get closer to the mic? Yeah, sorry. Um, that actually helps me seg to the next thing I wanted to ask. Um, which is how do we bring vision into the equation? Uh, I think, so on the biomechanics side, I'm sure there's a lot that I'm not aware of, but John Mathis's work is the only work that I actually know about that they really look at how uh, vision and locomotion. And in the robotic side, I think we're, we've gotten quite good at blind locomotion. Uh, but there's not very much where we actually use vision effectively, except in like identifying where are like good places to put uh, footholds, but I don't think we really use this in the feedback loop yet. 
Uh, so is this something any of you are, are looking into or do you have thoughts on, um, is this actually something that's important? Not just on the planning side, but actually to use this in feedback? So um, there's maybe not as much work on like human locomotion and visual feedback, but there's actually a huge literature, a huge body of literature with flying. Um, so things like Drosophila definitely use visual feedback. Um, things like hummingbirds and pigeons and all kinds of things, they are very like optically oriented and they use a ton of optical flow to determine how fast they're going, for example. So if you have like what looks like horizontal bars on either side of a hallway and you fly a bird through it, um, if you have uh, one side that is at a higher frequency than the other side, it'll think that it's going kind of faster on that side and then kind of go away towards, it's either away or towards. If you have a projector and you project bars onto an area and then you flow them towards the moving animal, they will slow down because they think they're moving too fast. If you put them away, they'll think they're they're moving too slowly. If you have Drosophila and you rotate it, um, they'll turn. So there's this like really amazing meeting um, that happens every, I think every two years and it's called neuroethology. Um, and they do just a ton of really lover, really clever experiments trying to figure out how sensory information gets input into motor control, not just locomotion, but any other kind of motor control and kind of how the two are synchronized and, and synthesized. Do you know of any work where they look at this, but for legged locomotion? Mm. There is, do you know? Yeah. Yes. Well, there is some work done with like, like invis in, invisible perturbations. Like obviously one of the most yeah. more known ones is one of uh, Dr. Daly's earlier work with the birds that step through the perturbation that they can't see. Um, there's some recent work done on humans while they're hopping to get a perturbation, uh, some things they don't see, but I, I, I do not know about like the similar, like trying to guide, um, motor output based on side visual guides, but that's also done in, in, in fish, but that's still not yeah. locomotion. But there's, <laughs> locomotion there's actually... As, like, locomotion. There are these really new fancy, like newfangled treadmills that they make with virtual reality, like immersive environments. And so the treadmills, they, they move around like this and they can kind of like rotate. And so they have you walking um, in this virtual area and they do like they're, this is mostly done in like kinesiology departments. Um, people who work on kinesiology and they're doing work on humans again um, and how different things in your environment can affect how you move and how you walk. I mean, can you imagine how cool it is to put a virtual reality brill on the uh, glass on a guinea fowl? <laughs> I feel that they would just freak out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sort of that are like actually, they're actually pretty cool. Uh, I've been to a haunted house where they actually had basically these walls that revolve like just from a projector and it's just hard not to not to lean even if you know what's going on. Um, maybe for Zaming and, and uh, Joao, uh, in the robotic side, do you think it's uh, going to be useful to actually integrate vision, not for planning, but as feedback, considering that um, like IMUs are actually much better, I think, uh, our IMUs are much better than our inner ear for biology. Uh, does this make the vision part, like the optical flow part, redundant, or do you think there's something useful to be gotten? Like, is it something that we should be looking into? I surely think so. So I recently did an experiment uh, in Steve Collins' lab where I'm asking, I, I'm being asked to walk on a treadmill with blindfold, and it's really scary. And I basically I failed the test, and yeah. So I think visual feedback is very important. Mm -hmm. um, 
Like for example, currently when you see robots that can work walking around, typically there's a human operating the system, like controlling the speed, etc. But if you want to get out, get rid of the human, then possibly you need some visual feedback for sure. Yeah, I, I think that <clears throat> uh, I think that vision is important to anything that you want to anticipate, right? You, you want to. So there's a really cool uh, presentation from what is that uh, Marco Hutter that he was talking about the benefits of model-based control and reinforcement learning. And then one of his students said that you know model-based control is really good for, for example, uh, choosing stepping stones. So right, so if you want to say you can say here, 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 it is a good thing. But if you had like for example tall grass, then uh, then model base would not, would not wouldn't know uh, what to do. And reinforcement learning is the other way around. So the person learning knows that tall grass is just tall grass, and then they just step on it. Um, so I think that is some really cool, useful things that, that you can do with with vision in the sense of for example, as many things about the world and tuning your controller better. But um, I think that it's just. I don't see how we can use like locally really fast, but I think you can be used in a longer, slightly longer term uh, than everything else, right? So one or two steps in advance. Yeah, vision actually, it, it's very expensive to compute things based on vision, right? So maybe you cannot do very fast loop around that. This is also something to consider. Yeah, but uh, like uh, Xiaomi was saying that, you know, he's commanding stuff at 30 Hertz and vision is, around 30, 20 hertz. So maybe it's okay. I don't know. Yeah. But like, this is, okay, this is a question coming from a biologist that does not know a lot about ro robots. But like, we know, we learned, like animals, humans, we have learned over the years what to focus on when we look. Isn't it really hard? Like, I can only imagine it's really hard to from a, imagine it's a camera, to from a view to take actually the information you need? Like, yeah. <laughs> <No idea>. uh, <laughs> yes, very hard. And I think the, yeah. the thing that is hard is, I think is not only extracting the information, is knowing the context of the information, right? So when you, as a human, as you walk around and you, you know, you look, there's a couch or there's something, there's a handle, you know how to like, classify things and know what's what, right? In, I think what's hard about vision is the fact that, you know, the robot not only needs to extract features from the environment, it also needs to know what that thing is, what is used for, and can I step on it, right? So all those things is actually what is really complicated. So- Okay, so, so we learn over years of our lives when we start, when we make our first steps to like, first bike ride, whatever, we learn how to put information in what box. So is it then not, because you, like you all say, robots are much faster than animals. Is it then not about what we need to teach the robot? Like, I'm obviously like, I'm a biologist, but if it is about the learning process, is it then that we do not know what we need to teach them? Or like, you know what I mean? It's like if it is that they need to learn that a handle is a handle to grab, mm -hmm. or if they see something else, then it's a learning. Then it's something about learning, right? I think that's well, one part of the problem. I'm not sure yeah. if that's the main part of the problem, just because I think we just don't know. Okay. So we are still yeah, we... struggling with the low-level control problem. That's why we didn't touch the high-level understanding of the scene and everything. This is this is the main reason to me. And we have a thing called like semantic image segmentation as well, where you can kind of like see a, a whole view of something and it'll identify like, oh, like this is this is like a cup or like this is a tree or this is a road. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can do a lot with that, but it's not sufficient for getting us like the right amount of control yet. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that we're working on having these kind of more intuitive or more like the way that we understand how we move through a world and, and identify objects and, and waypoints, um, but we're not quite equivalent yet. Just like to remind, if anybody has questions, feel free to, well, yeah. We have a question from uh, Jeremy. 
Hi, yeah, uh, this is Jeremy Dow from uh, Oregon State. Thank you, everyone, for all your talks. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, yeah, just continue to talk about the vision. Um, you know, like, Jamie, you mentioned you were in this experiment where you had to walk blind on the treadmill. Like, do you think some of those experiences are because, like, we learned to walk with vision? So maybe, like, especially mm -hmm. given, you know, the success of all the reinforcement learning stuff, when it only sees all this experience blind and it, it does okay. So like maybe that's fine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need vision because we go up at that, but you know, what, what level of, of visual information is actually important? I was just you know, curious on everyone's thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah, so I think, again, so as I mentioned earlier, I think one of the, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but one of the reason that a policy like, doesn't need vision because there's an operator controlling the speed. So I recently visit, Marco Harder's lab and they have uh, like uh, operators that really know how to control the speed when it, when they commands the robot to walk across like a rough terrain and if I if, if you're giving it to a uh, like me probably I won't be able to make it walk across the center ring even though it's the same controller so I think like we are also giving the robot some vision because we are controlling it with our eyes yeah but that's also the planning problem, right? So if the mm -hmm. speed control problem is planning ahead, but for instantaneous or reactive controller, still do you think, so let's say um, I don't want to control the speed, I want to step in place, right? Mm -hmm. For this kind of task, do you think vision is required or? Mm, or yeah, I can step in, like I can definitely step in place with, um, with my eyes closed, for sure, yeah. So it's more if you, mostly uh, for planning into the future. Yeah. Well, I think the user adjusting the velocity is kind of the high level choosing the command input that's easy to track for the low level, right? And I, I think mm -hmm. this kind of hierarchy is something we don't understand well enough. And especially in, in reinforcement learning, we're not using uh, that much. And, and I liked in Yannick's presentation, I think it was in your presentation, you had this uh, figure with the different loops at different time scales. And I think especially, well, both for vision and other things, but especially for vision, we don't really understand where to put that in, in this hierarchy and how to actually, um, yeah, how, how to tune this and how to connect those different layers. Yeah, actually I have a question on that topic from biology, from Yanoke or Talia. So my question is that, do we, or human or biological system, do, do they use um, low level feedback to tune their high level controller? Do we have the feedback from low level to high level or not? Or it's always one directional? For instance, we do planning and then we execute from the low level without getting any feedback. Are they separated or no? All this spectrum we see, they are all interconnected. They are all interconnected. And um, one one good example of that is that is proprioception. So proprioception, a part of proprioception origin, origins from like our muscles. So um, we have a good feeling of where our body is all the time because of proprioception. And that is something we consciously can have. I can know, uh, I mean, people tell me that this is a, an often thing done at yoga please feel your feet. You know where your feet are just because you know where the status of your body and where your body is. So that is that whole loop back up. Uh, how far down does perception about external perception go down into the hierarchy? Like, do we need that for, um, I guess it's maybe, it depends on the robustness that you're trying to hit. Like if you're just working on flat ground, you're okay. But if you're working on like sort of rocky terrain, then you you need to look down and adjust like, you know, my foot is, you know, five, feet my, five centimeters to the right of where I'm expecting it. So you need that visual adjustment. Like, I guess for humans, do we have an idea of yeah, how far down the control hierarchy does external perception go? I think this is a, a great question for, um, for study. And I think that this is the kind of stuff that people are trying to figure out in a lot of other animals. Like for humans, it's really complex. Like we've got a lot going on. Um, if you take a, a much simpler organism, um, you can get a better sense for, okay, what is, what is the hierarchy of like 
maybe the magnitude of feedback that you need. Um, and then, you know, with, with different, as the magnitude increases, which additional sensors do you incorporate? What kind of information do you incorporate as you have to increase the magnitude of your correction um, to recover from a perturbation? And I think this is the kind of stuff that's, that's being done a lot in like cockroaches. Um, this is like, these questions are perfect for the neuroethology community, actually. So I think that there's a huge potential for, um, for cross-pollination there. Actually, at this last neuroethology conference, there was a whole session on robotics for neuroethology. And we had like Alka Iskard, we had like all kinds of people working on robotics um, to answer these sorts of questions, like building these sort of robotic neural networks to try and recreate what they see in the animals. So I think it's an open area for study for sure. But I, I want to add that there is also a body of um, research that's done on uh, human musculoskeletal modeling that actually use more and more feedback and feed forward and proprioceptive loops because that's we finally are getting that these models can actually have uh, forms of feedback. Um, so that's definitely something where they are trying to work with like how much proprioception is coming back. And, and also the addition to something that's really important there is that every step in these systems have a lot of noise. Um, so there's noise from things outside, but there's also in our, in our body, there's noise. Uh, Majid, are there any questions they saw in the um, in the form? Uh, I actually I have a question for Talia. For uh, so like you in your talk you mentioned a new model that's similar to the uh, in what is with spring in what the pendulum thing, but you add the torsion thing. So like I wonder how do you like how do you come up with those model? Like is there like you just like think about it all the time, then suddenly there's an idea or, yeah. Well, the mm -hmm. way that I, I did it is that I had a really great collaborator who came up with <laughs> the model. <laughs> so um, I, uh, so Jen Yugan, who um, is a professor at Syracuse now, um, we, I shared my uh, Jerboa data with him and, and he, and I have been working together for a while to try and figure out what's an appropriate model for it. And so we kind of go back and forth and we try different things and we find something yeah. that, that fits the data. Um, but yeah, okay. I, that's a good question for Genu. Yeah, I wonder if there's a data-driven way of designing this kind of reduce order model, like we can automatically discover some reduce order model from data, that would be really cool. Yeah. Right, I, I wonder if we could, but then I also wonder if it would be um like the simplest model you know like if you do something that's data driven like it's not necessarily going to be um the simplest model it might be like a much more complex model and so we're really hoping to go for this kind of like in the template anchor framework of model mm -hmm. complexity we we're really trying to go for a template model um i think it would be cool to to definitely do like a data driven thing where where you're trying to find um a baseline model it's hard to know, it's hard to predict, I think, the complexity of it. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I think you can probably penalize complexity too, right? You can say you yeah. can only have X amount of parameters or degrees of freedom or whatever. And you may come up with a completely different model that is just as simple, but also fits the data. So actually, it's right. a then, good idea. I wonder if you can get something. Yeah, but then I also wonder if it would like make sense sense for something like um, robot design. Like for example, like with it's this two-legged model where you have torsional springs, it's actually really great to have those torsional springs on the model because it tells you sort of the mechanism of how it's doing these gate transitions through these changes in the passive swing leg dynamics. And that makes a lot of sense just intuitively when we look at the dynamics of the um, of the gerboa. And then 
it can help us a lot when we design um, controllers for robots too, because like a lot of other uh, gate transition models, like they'll tell you that you need to change the touchdown leg angle, but it won't tell you how it did that. It just says you need to change this angle. Whereas this one, it tells you the dynamics of the model and it will result in these changes in that, in that leg angle. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder if the, like if we constrain a data durin model to give us something that's really simple and, and finds a, a very descriptive model, but it's like totally different from what we would find. I wonder if that would cause us to um, like build a totally different robot that looks nothing like the Jerboa, which might be really interesting. Um, and I wonder if it would make as intuitive sense. Like there's a there's a big part of me that really enjoys it when like the model that we find makes intuitive sense when we go back and look at the dynamics of the animal. But, but I think that that's where you hit on a really important point is that you can make a model that explains the data that you find, even though the model does something seemingly different that finds a mechanistic underlying governing principle of how this animal walks, something that like most biomechanists and biologists are really interested in. But then there's a whole different layer where you can try to look at from some very specific that maybe requires you to make the model way more complex or way more simple. And then building a robot out of it, I can only imagine that that also can go either way. So it, yeah, it, I think reminds, it depends on your question. Absolutely. This reminds me of a really um, interesting poster and talk I saw at ICRA in Montreal, like 2018. Um, and there was a researcher from Disney, and I don't remember his name, but he had a video where he was like, I want to build any robot that can precisely trace this motion as efficiently as possible. And it looked like something that, you know, you could draw with your hand or, or something like that. And he came up with this like strange, like triangular robot that would like roll around and, and one piece of it would make this one motion. And I was like, why? why on earth do you need something like that? Like when you could have something that is more like biological or humanoid. And he's like, well, all I care about is that motion. And, and so he came up with something totally different from what I, I would have come up with. And he did it through just this like different set of constraints. I think that's exactly the beauty of data-driven approaches is the fact that theoretically, you're not biasing the results because your model may be very good, but you're biased by your understanding and interpretation of locomotion. Data driven in, I think the way you should do is you should come up with something that, you know, does a job, lowest cost, but not necessarily the thing that we would expect to be intuitive, right? So, and I think that's what it would be nice to see it. Like, could you come up with a, something that is completely revolutionary that is not intuitive at all, and that that maybe is the best solution. Well, and I, I think that, like, again, that's that's another good point you bring up. You say, like, if it's if you would optimize for 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 cost, but as Talia pointed out, and which also counts for kangaroo rats, they are not efficient at all. Like, being small is expensive. So, and and that's why they don't care that locomotion is expensive because being small is already expensive. So the addition of energy cost to move is relatively much lower than being big. Yeah, they, their cost is safety, right? Or in predictability or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So it's still a cost. It's just a different cost. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, my brain automatically goes to energy. <laughs> That's a, a big topic that I would have loved to talk about, as well as just how do we choose our cost design. I think one reason to keep our biases and keep the intuition is that we don't know how to write down the actual cost that we want. And so if we go pure data driven, we're probably going to get the wrong solution just because we didn't write down the right one. Um, but we're at um, actually four minutes past, so I don't want to. And thank you, everybody, for staying up so late um, and, and sticking around for this and for the great talks and the great discussion. And 